I've had a request to do some nuclear pass paper questions from one of my viewers, so that's what I'm going to do. I've picked out two that I think are very good. The first one is about uranium glass. Um, it contains a maximum of 2% usually, but ones from um, the early part of the 20th century can have up to 25%. And this student carried out an investigation to determine what that percentage was. The student measured the count rate by placing a GM tube against the vase at a single position. This value was used to calculate the decay rate for the whole vase. Show that the decay constant for uranium is about that. This is a fairly standard first question. It's just using the equations that are given to you in the data book. And so we're going to use the equation lambda is equal to ln2 over t half, which is the half-life. And so it's a fairly straightforward calculation. It's ln2 over 1.41 times 10 to the 17, giving us an answer of 4.92 times 10 to the minus 18. And don't forget the unit per second. We know it's per second, first of all, because they tell us it is, but also because our half-life is given in seconds, and that means you'll have your decay constant in per seconds. The second part of this question is the six marker. For many calculation six markers, organizing the data is the first step and will gain you several of the marks, and also gives you an opportunity to sort of see what you have in reality. So you get a list of data like this, and the first thing to do here is to look at our background count rate and our count rate with the GM tube. And we should notice that these are not in the standard units, and they're not even in the same unit. So our first job is to get these down into counts per second. So if we have, let's start with the count rate of the GM tube. We have 3623 in 5 minutes. So that means we've got 3623 divided by 5 times 60, or 12.08 counts per second. Okay, now let's get the background count rate into counts per second as well. So 525 in 10 minutes over 10 times 60, that will give us 0 0.875 counts per second for our background. We should know that if we want to find the count rate from the vase, then we have to take the background away from any count that we have, making sure, of course, like we just did, that they're in the same unit. So we're going to subtract these two. We get 11.2 counts per second from the little window of our GM tube. The next piece of information we're going to look at is this set of information here. So we're given the area of the GM tube and the surface area of the vase, and we want to know what the count rate from the whole vase is, and this is just the count rate from the window. So we have to scale this count rate up to the surface area of the vase. So what we're going to do is find what the multiplication factor between these two is. So how many times bigger is the surface area of the vase to the area of the window? So if we take our surface area of the vase, and we divide it by the surface area of, of the area of the window, that will give us our multiplication factor, which is 278.3. Now we multiply that by 11.2 so that we can scale it all up, and we get 3,117 counts per second. That is for the whole vase, and we should consider that our activity. That is the number of decays per second that is happening for the uranium in the whole vase. Now I want the percentage of uranium by mass in the glass. Well, we know that the mass of the vase is 149 grams, and the mass of one uranium atom is 238U. So first of all, we're going to see how many particles of uranium does this activity correspond to. And we have an equation in our data book to allow us to calculate that, and that says A is equal to minus lambda N. And this is where the information from the first part of this question, remembering this is part two and this was part one, so these two will be connected. So at some point you know you're going to have to use 
this decay constant, if A is minus lambda N, then we know that 317 is going to be equal to minus 4.92 times 10 to the minus 18 times N, giving us an N of 6.335 times 10 to the 20. So that is our number of uranium atoms. What we need to see is what mass does that correspond to? So that we can compare that to the mass of the phase and get a percentage. So if we have that number of uranium atoms, 6.335 times 10 to the 20, and we know that each uranium atom is 238U, we multiply that by 238, and multiply that by what the mass equivalent or the kilogram is equivalent of 1U is. And that is given in our data as well. That's 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27, giving us a mass of uranium of 2.50 times 10 to the minus 4 kilograms. Our final job now is to compare this mass with our 149 grams. Again, watching your units, because one of them is in kilograms and one of them is in grams. So we want to find what percentage that is of 149 grams. So we put 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 149 times 10 to the minus 3, so that they're both in kilograms, multiplied by 100, and we get a final answer of 0.17%. Tackling these questions can sometimes feel like you don't know where to go. And the most important thing is to make a start. Start sorting out your information. Look at what they're giving you and how they connect together. Here, the most obvious start was background and count rate, because at least we can do something with that. And you'll still get some marks, even if you stop there. But hopefully, having done that, you will be able to think about what the next steps might be. Then it says, uranium decays by emitting alpha particles. Criticize the method used to determine the percentage of uranium in the vase. This is asking you to use what you know about alpha particles and their use in this method. And we know that alpha particles are very low penetrating power. So that means that only alpha particles from the surface of the glass would make it to the GM tube. So any alpha particles that might have been released by uranium further in from the surface of the glass aren't going to reach that tube because they can't pass through the glass. And that's supposing they can actually pass through the window of the GM tube, which could be a second point. But I think the better point to make is that, of course, like all radioactive decay, the alpha particles are emitted in all directions, not just out to the outside of the glass. So some are then going to travel to the interior of the vase rather than to the exterior. So again, you're likely to be making an underestimate of this percentage of uranium because you're only detecting those that travel from the glass to the outside. The question goes on to say uranium nucleus decays to thorium by emission of an alpha particle. So if we just write the nuclear decay equation like that, it can be assumed that all the energy of the decay is transferred to kinetic energy of the alpha particle, and we want the speed. And of course, we know that kinetic energy is a half mv squared. So what we need to figure out is how much kinetic energy does the alpha particle have, and we do that from figuring out how much is the energy from the decay. So we're told 238.0003 is the mass of the uranium. The mass of the thorium, 233.9942 plus the mass of our alpha particles, 4.0015. We can leave them in U at the moment until we're ready to convert. The sum of these two is 237.9957. And what you, as you can see, these are not the same number. So we are looking for the mass deficit here, our change in mass, because that's what's going to be converted into energy. And all we do is subtract the mass of the uranium the mass of the thorium and alpha from the mass of the uranium. 
And if we do that, we end up with 4.6 times 10 to the minus 3 EU. Now we can go ahead and convert it into kilograms by multiplying by 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27. And again, that is given to you in the data book, so you don't need to remember that. And giving you a delta M in kilograms of 7.636 times 10 to the minus 30. That is the mass that has disappeared in inverted commas. In fact, that has been turned into energy, and we can use Einstein's equation to figure out how much energy that is. Our energy is mass, change in mass, times c squared. And you're simply multiplying your mass up here in kilograms by 9 times 10 to the 16, which is the value of c squared, giving you an energy change of 8.8724 times 10 to the minus 13 joules, which we know is going to be transformed into kinetic energy of the alpha particle. So that number, 8.8724 times 10 to the minus 13, is equal to half times the mass of the alpha particle, which we know is 4.0015, times our conversion factor for u again, times v squared. And you do your calculations, you divide 8.8724 and 10 to the minus 13 by a half of this product here, and then square root the answer, you'll get a V of 1.44 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. If you know what you're doing with radioactivity calculations, this is a very nice question. And there are, over the last few years, several questions that involved relatively complex looking radioactivity calculations, but if you do plenty of practice, they are actually pretty straightforward. The second question I'm going to do today, astronauts on that Apollo mission brought back many rock samples from the moon. It's believed that one of these contains a piece of rock that originated on the Earth about four billion years ago. It's believed to have been launched into space when we were struck by an asteroid. It contains uranium. The radioactive decay of uranium allows it to be used to determine the time since the rock was formed. The uranium isotope becomes lead isotope through a series of decays. Calculate the number of alpha and the number of beta particles emitted for one nucleus of uranium-238 to decay to become a nucleus of lead-206. Okay, we are simply using our atomic and mass numbers here. So if uranium-238-92 decays to lead 20682, that means we have a loss of 10 protons and a loss of minus 32 nucleons, in other words, protons and neutrons. This loss of nucleons is the biggest clue here, because with beta decay, we do not lose any neutrons. The number of neutrons does not change. And so we can use this. We know that each alpha will result in minus four nucleons, that is two protons and two neutrons. So we know that if we've had 32 nucleons altogether being lost, that loss must be due to our alpha decays. So that means, of course, eight point times four is 32. We have had to have eight alpha decays. So we have eight alpha particles. We also know that eight alpha decays would result in minus 16 protons. But we haven't lost 16 protons, we've only lost 10. But we also know that each beta minus decay, and it doesn't say beta minus here, but we can assume beta minus unless they tell us otherwise, each beta minus decay results in an increase in the mass number, so a gained proton. So that means that there's a difference of six between what we should have lost with our eight alpha decays and what we actually did lose with the whole decay series. So that means that we must have six beta minus decays, and therefore six beta particles. I have seen various forms of this question a few times, both across Edexcel, sometimes a shorter version in multiple choice, and also in AQA. This comes up a couple of times. So make sure that you understand the logic behind this. Second part of this question says the half-life of uranium is that many years. The other stages in the decay are so short that they can be ignored. There was no lead in the rock when it was formed. So all of the current lead in the sample is a product of the decay. 
So in the sample, for every 103 uranium nuclei, we now have 50 lead. So we need to think about the 103 represents our original number of uranium nuclei. And the 50 represents how many of those uranium nuclei have decay decayed into lead, which means that our current number of uranium nuclei is the difference between those two, which is 53. The first thing we have to do, of course, is find out what the decay constant is. is. And this, again, is using our decay constant is ln2 over the half-life. And so we get an answer of 1.55 times 10 to the minus 10 per year this time because we're putting in our half-life as years. We need that because we want the age of the sample. We want the time since the sample started to decay. And we're going to use our n is equal to n o e to the power of minus lambda t. n is 53, n o is 103, and we know 1.55 times 10 to the minus 10 is our lambda, and t is what we're after. Now, when we want to find a time since the beginning like this, it's caught up in the power of e. So we're going to have to find the natural logs of each one. So we have ln53 is equal to ln103 minus our product of 1.55 times 10 to the minus 10 times t. This is what happens when you take the natural logs. Anything that's to the power of e simply comes down, and it keeps its sign. The next step, of course, is to try and get t by itself. And to do that, we need to do ln53 minus ln103 is equal to minus 1.55 times 10 to the minus 10 t. So if you do that calculation, you get minus 0.664 and some change is equal to minus 1.55 times 10 to the minus 10 t. And after that, it's straightforward to find out that your t is 4.29 times 10 to the 9 years, as we were asked to do. Again, the key to knowing how to proceed with this is to read the question carefully and try and identify, what equation am I looking for? What equation am I going to be able to use? What am I trying to find? Here we were trying to find a t, a time since the beginning of a decay. And that gives you a clue that you need to use one of your decay equations. We don't have any information on counts per second or decays per second, so we can't really look at activity, but we do have information on the number of nuclei, so now we know that we're using the n equals no e to the power of minus lambda t. Plus, the clues have in having given us the half-life, we know that we need to get the decay constant. I hope you found this helpful. If you want me to do more, or you'd like me to do some on a different subject or topic, then please do let me know. It sometimes takes a little while, but I always listen to what my, my viewers would like to see, and I try to get it done for you.